Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Business and Economic Development Center is very proud to present our fourth annual entrepreneur lecture with Dr. Thomas. Today, we're having a very special guest, Mr. Richard Sanger, the owner of Bear Claw Knife and Shear. Mr. Sanger will be sharing with us his experience managing a successful business during these challenging times. But before that, I would like to take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Victoria Santiago, and I'm the new director of the Cardo Learning Center, home of the Business and Economic Development Center, also known as the BBC. The BBC has over 35 years of experience helping people from the permanent basin with personal and business finances. We help people increase their credit scores, purchase homes, and start or expand their businesses. Please feel free to grab a flyer and contact us if you would like to make an appointment. Our services are free to the media and college community. Well, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Thomas and Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, Victoria, let me echo my appreciation to our guests tonight for being here. Um, the uh, the entrepreneur series that we started with the BEDC has been a very popular event for us annually, and we've been able to uh, to uh, cajole uh, some business owners to come and share their story with us, and that's what we're planning to do tonight. The format we're going to follow is um, I'll ask uh, Richard a, a few questions, and, and then he can take it wherever he chooses. But we'll leave a little time at the end uh, to have Q&A from the audience. So if you hear something during the presentation um, that you want to follow up on, we'll feel free to do that. And so we appreciate y'all being here tonight. Uh, I know that there's a lot going on this evening in, in Midland, and uh, a lot of competition for people's time and resources, but we're glad you're here, and we're certainly, Richard, are glad you're here. Uh, I'm going to deviate from my script just for a minute, because I want to sure. go back to the, uh, I was reading the uh, press release, I don't know if you had a chance to see that, mm. that, was, uh, that was put out um, either yesterday or today, but it was talking about you know, your background and, and on being the owner of uh, Barraclaw, Knight and Shear, but mm -hmm. there was a couple of things in here caught my eye, and it, now it says that your father was a, a, a jeweler. That's correct, and yeah. And a gemologist. Yep. And uh, he had a small retail store, and then you were introduced in the 1970s to classic retail. I was. But then you go on to say, quote, and I, I assume this is attributed to you, uh, retail was very different back then. In some ways it was more difficult, and in some ways much easier. Though the retail business has become much more technical and complex, the fundamentals remain the same. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of elaborate on, on that uh, quote? Fundamentals? Well, what's, what's different? What's the same about retail? <laughs> what's different? Um, computers make, uh, make retail, in a lot of ways, so much easier. And so much easier to manage because of all the analytics that we can pull at a moment's notice. If I need a balance sheet or a profit and loss statement, um, I just have to ask Maya. Everybody give Maya a hand. She's not here today, but we, we love her because she keeps me profitable and sane and, and, and in business. Um, but I just ask her or I get on QuickBooks and I can pull it up easily and, uh, and you have that. But even beyond that, we can get on the computer now uh, through our POS system. POS is a, a, a point of sale system that we sell everything through that we utilize to control the business. And uh, I could pull up any one of a number of analytics from um, uh, everything that each individual salesperson up front is doing to um, how large the carts are, not, not just for the individuals, but as a whole, um, how large our carts are as compared to other years or other months within other years. Um, I could really break it down to, uh, to whatever I want. And, and find out what's happening inside the business. Um, uh, and being able to do that allows you to fix problems quicker before they become bigger problems. It also allows you to better manage the company. For instance, um, uh, cart size, you know, or, or the number of items that 
that each salesperson is selling on average. So for instance, if I've got somebody like Paul here, hi Paul, everyone give Paul a hand. He's our director of, of, of culinary arts there in, in Bear Claw. And I can look and I can see if, you know, what Paul is doing as far as sales, how many, on average, how many items does Paul sell for each sale? And Paul is number one in our store. So, so we look at that and we see how many items are each person. Are they upselling items? Are they asking if, uh, you know, the, do you need fries with that? Have you ever gone through the McDonald's and they say, have you need, you want fries with this? Well, well we do that too, but it's, it's, it's a little different. We don't, we don't sell fries. So we do the same thing. If you buy one thing, you may need something else that goes with it. Um, and so we ask. Paul asks, and that's why his uh, average cart size is so much larger than everyone else's. So tomorrow we're going to have a meeting, tomorrow we're going to talk to all the different associates and we're going to say, all right, this is what Paul is doing, we need the rest of you to come up to where Paul is. Look at what Paul does, let Paul show you how it's done, let's make each cart larger. We do two things by doing that, one, we become more profitable, but we also provide better customer service to our, our customers. It's better customer service. You're not doing them a disservice by asking them if they need something else that's associated with that item they're buying. You're providing them better customer service. So by being able to narrow down uh, using computers to these little different little analytics, we're able to better manage our business, not just with our people, but also with the books, also with every aspect of what we do. The downside to that is that sometimes we get lost in the analytics. We don't realize that retail sales is no different than it was in 1976. It's taking care of people, it's providing them a lot to look at when they come into your store, it's still merchandising and how we merchandise, um, it's, it's advertising and marketing and all those things that were the same back in the 1970s. They're the same as they are now. And sometimes we get so caught up with what am I doing online and what are the online analytics and what are our analytics in the store and who's coming in and buying what and what is our demographic doing and what's our advertising doing and where's that going? We forget that the basics of retail are still the same. You provide great customer service in a small community. Um, you do all those things right that you had to do even back in the 1970s and even back 2,000 years years ago, it's all the same. Retail is still retail. Customers are still customers. And if you don't take care of them, they won't come back. Okay. So, so did you, uh, are you the founder uh, of Veracall or did you purchase Veracall? You know, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I purchased the company um, back at the, the turn of the century, way back when, at Art One, that was 2000, 1999, 2000. Um, me and my then wife purchased the company and uh, uh, we actually purchased the property and Bear Claw happened to be on the property. The gentleman that, that started it started up in New Mexico first and then moved it to Big Spring and was there for about 12 years and he passed, unfortunately. His widow still lived there. She lived in the house that was on the property and uh, I just stopped to take a look. I was trying to find a way of being in you know, big spring more and not being away so much. I just got married about a year before and um, I wanted to be home more and I was traveling all over the country at the time. So uh, I, would, I drove by it, saw it, remembered my father-in-law was talking about it. So I turned around and parked and took a look and uh, the rest is history. We, we ended up buying the property and the business with it. And then I opened it up just as a sharpening shop, just as something to do between other businesses and, and other things that I was doing at the time. It was just supposed to be a little hobby. And uh, it took off from there, eventually. Okay, so, so. you were a sharpener. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was your skill set for that particular business at the time. Mm -hmm. Then I read where you've expanded it to do other things in, in an expansion market. Uh, your you customer bet. base. So, when did that? When did those ideas begin to gel that you need to do more than just sharpen knives? You know, I, I really enjoyed sharpening, and I did that for several years, just sharpening. Back then, we did a lot of saw blades and, and a lot of uh, more industrial type tooling and such. 
um, a lot of things we don't do any longer. But uh, really enjoyed sharpening. Then a friend of mine came in. Um, he was a uh, sheriff's deputy back then, Brad Ingram. I don't know if anyone here knows Brad Ingram, but Brad and I were buds forever. And he came in and said, you've got to start carrying knives. Nobody carries knives out here. And I told him, Brad, I don't want to carry knives. <sighs> it's retail. You know, I did retail. I grew up in retail. I, I don't know, Brad. And he says, you've got to get some knives in here. So I ordered up some knives from a, a company uh, here in Texas, actually. They, they have them made in other places, but they're here in Texas. So I ordered up uh, two dozen knives, and within a day or two, they were all gone. And uh, you don't have to hit me over the head twice to get me to realize when there might be a little opportunity there. Still, I didn't foresee it as being a real business, the, the kind I'm accustomed to. I just, it's my hobby. I'll just throw some knives in. So I bought some more knives, and then I bought some more knives. And the store at that time was in Big Spring. We were in Big Spring 13 years before we moved out. So uh, I ended up with a store with a very small showroom, um, very big area for sharpening, but a very small showroom. And we ended up packing it full of knives until one day we had a German manufacturer, Boker, from out of Germany. And their representative uh, from their office flew down to Big Spring, flew down to Midland and drove to Big Spring. And he walked in and was looking around. And he comes up to me and he says, I'm from Boker. I want to know what it is that you're doing, that you're selling so many of our knives. And that's when I pretty much realized that we had the potential to do some things. And I started looking at, uh, even back then, I started looking at Midland as really being our market. So uh, we started developing Midland a little bit more until finally moving out here. So that was the motivation for moving, was really just to- uh, market, market size. Base, yeah, uh, yeah. Same product. Um, but then you, you spun off of that and did some other things. Mm -hmm. I read where you uh, now see yourself as perhaps a chef on the side, is that? Well, no, no, no. It, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express the other night, but no, no. Um, I tell you who the chef is, so Paul? Paul the chef. Paul is a pretty impressive chef. Yeah, every night he makes dinner for his family, let me tell you. I need to move in over there. He's, he's really good. I play at it. But we do give cooking classes. In fact, we're going to be bringing those back here after the holidays. So, uh, uh, you know, we're looking for chefs now to do that. So we bring in the real chefs in order to do that. My knife skills are pretty good. I'm okay. Paul's much better than I am. But uh, really, we love bringing in chefs to do cooking classes and, and to teach people how to do some of these things. We have uh, knife skills classes that we teach from time to time. And Paul's going to be teaching a lot more. You didn't know about this yet. But Paul's going to be teaching. <laughs> sit, sit. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be I, I don't have him do enough. Um, so he's going to be teaching more and more as we get into the new year. And, uh, and, and introducing people to cooking real food. We, we all eat out way too much, and real food is so much better. And it's easy to cook at home. You don't have to be uh, an incredibly skilled to really cook some good meals at home. And nobody does that better than Paul. Okay. Well, we, we've done this series for a while now, and one of the themes that, um, that I hear with each of our speakers when we talk about how they started and, you know, how they built their business and you know, being successful at it is, is not easy. But the, the, the theme is there's, as an entrepreneur, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever market you're going into, whatever business you're getting, there's a lot of risk involved in that. And, sure. Um, tell me about how stressful that is <laughs> and where, where in your journey has it been you were really sweating whether you're going to be able to pull it off or not. There is off and on a lot of stress associated with owning a small business. Um, owning a business or being an entrepreneur is mostly about overcoming challenges and solving puzzles. 
And, and that's what you mainly do all day long every day. You're trying to figure out the puzzle. How can you make it more profitable? How can you get paid this week? How can you make sure payroll is met? Um, it's always figuring out that puzzle. And there are times when you mess up. Right around 2016, our oil business went flat. And uh, I thought that gravy train was gonna go on forever. <laughs> and we're coming up onto, you know, September, we're getting into September, and I have Christmas coming up and I have a $150,000 line of credit with a bank. And I'm looking at that bank and I'm thinking that bank is gonna be getting nervous. That bank's gonna be getting nervous and they're gonna call that line of credit due. And I don't have $150,000 in my back pocket. So what do you do? I decided that the best thing I could do to make sure that and all my suppliers get paid is to do a going out of business sale during Christmas. And while doing that going out of business sale, I run the risk of going out of business, but I also bring in a lot of people for the Christmas season, which brings in a lot of money and also brings in people that might want to be investors for Bear Claw Knife and Shear. So I was able to bring in three investors, one of them backed out, the other two came on board, and they came on board with enough to not only take care of our, um, by the way, what we sold took care of almost all of what we owed everything through that, through that sale. But it also brought in enough that we could move to our current location, which is a much better retail location, and expand in the process and do a lot more. Um, and they've been, they've been great partners in, in all of this. Uh, they're really, really good. I couldn't hope for two finer gentlemen to do something like this. So right up until those papers were signed, things were a little tense. I didn't sleep much. <laughs> That, that's a common story I heard from my dad, who was an entrepreneur when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. said the greatest stress for him was always trying to figure out how to make payroll. So when you have people who work for you and count on that, that paycheck, oh, yeah. uh, and you're the one that has to figure it out. That, so there's, there's a lot of reward, obviously, in being a, a small business person and having a successful business, but there's also a lot of risk and a lot of stress. And as long as you understand that, then jump up there and see what, what you can do. You know, especially this time of year. I don't sleep much this time of year because it's the same thing every year. We always struggle to try and get that balance right between the amount of merchandise we bring in and when we bring it in compared to what kind of business we're doing. Now, last year, and even more so this year, we're really, we don't know what to expect. Um, everything is so stirred up. We, we really don't know what we're going to sell between now and the end of the year. So trying to anticipate what those sales are going to be like is almost impossible. So something like that can certainly add a lot of stress, a lot of hand-wringing, because, you know, we're, we're up to our eyeballs right now in, in, in buying, but trying not to buy too much buy too little, you leave too much on the table. And then your customers are angry with you because they're coming to see you uh, on Christmas Eve and you have nothing to give them. So it's, uh, yeah, it could, be, it could be plenty stressful. And there are weeks, sometimes months, where you don't get paid. Someone else get paid. For instance, Lauren would get paid. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Another one of our fantastic salespeople. In fact, right over here, Paul is on the left there, then that's Lauren in the middle. Uh, she's outside sales, and then Edmund over here just joined us. He's also working right now in outside sales, but he's going to be moving into operations pretty quick. Three of my best people right there. Thank so you, guys. I were hoping we would go over to Paul's house. <laughs> Well, you've actually hit on a question that someone wanted to know about. Mm -hmm. How did COVID impact your business? Good question. Um, boy, COVID was rough. Um, when I first heard about COVID, uh, I knew it was coming about two or three weeks before it actually, the whole situation got all 
started up here. So I called the staff in and I told the staff, didn't I? I said, y'all need to go out and get some supplies, especially toilet paper. Go out right now, get your supplies, get it now. And um, a couple of them rolled their eyes up at me. Just Richard, you know, get toilet paper. <laughs> so we went out, we got enough toilet paper, not only for us to last us through a couple of months, but also in case one of our employees didn't have any, we had extra, right, Lauren? So, <laughs> so, um, so we, were, we were prepared for it. In fact, uh, I was so worried about the numbers they were initially coming out with, these huge numbers, millions of people are going to die. It's, it's going to be the worst thing since the Spanish flu, that we closed a couple of days early before they, 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 they made a mandate and they, they asked us all to close down. Um, and we closed a couple of days early before that. I did not want any of my people getting that. But then as we went on, week one, week two, week three, we're all sitting at home trying to take care of the few emergencies when, when they happen. Um, we come to find out that the numbers aren't anywhere near what they were saying. And this wasn't the type of, of uh, emergency that they tried to make it out to be. Of course, now we all know it's it's a bad thing, but not near what they were portraying it as in the beginning. So we opened back up. Um, we opened back up. I actually called up a, um, uh, uh, an attorney out in Dallas that is a, uh, a big um, constitutional attorney out in Dallas. And I said, listen, we don't know if we're one of those companies that, you know, has to be open or, or not. What, what do they call it? Um, essential, business. essential businesses. You know, we might be because we deal with a lot of food service, but we might not be. If I just went ahead and opened up with a limited staff, how, how would that be? He says, you need to send me a retainer. <laughs> so I sent him a retainer. We went ahead and opened up at the same weekend that a um, beautician opened up her salon in Dallas. She got arrested. I did not. And I was prepared. I did not. Because we have an amazing mayor here. Because we have an amazing uh, sheriff and an amazing police chief that are all very conservative. And, and they didn't. They didn't. They, they never even came in and gave me a hard time. It, it, nothing. And we were very careful. We kept everything very clean. Still do, actually, don't we? We, we clean constantly. And, um, we, we took all the precautions, but, but we opened up. And then they came out and mandated these masks. And I could not see us forcing people to wear a mask. Um, I, I just couldn't see us doing that. I, I don't really care if somebody wears a mask, if someone doesn't wear a mask, if my own staff, if they wear a mask, they don't wear a mask. Uh, I didn't think it was right for me to discriminate against people because they don't have a mask on, okay? I, but I wanted to warn people that wanted to wear the mask, that were genuinely afraid, and they have every right to be, that there were going to be people in there that didn't have a mask. So I put up a sign that says, no mask required. And uh, boy, I tell you what, there was a group here in town and it just hit the fan. They put up a face, Facebook group and, and let's boycott Bear Claw and let's find out what other businesses aren't requiring masks. Let's boycott them. And, uh, and I just, I, I didn't understand that. So I did a video. It's one of the first videos I did on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Richard Steinberg making knives, by the way. Give me a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. <laughs> and uh, I put a, a video up there saying, listen, I don't care whether you wear a mask, don't wear a mask, I don't care what color of your, your, your skin is, I don't care how you wear your hair, I don't even care if you wear a little ponytail, you know? Come into the store. You're welcome in my store. I'm thrilled every time someone comes into our store. And they need to make the choice as to what they want to do. If you don't want to come into the store because there are people there that aren't wearing masks, that's called freedom. You can choose not to shop in Bear Claw. But I'm not going to make that choice for you. I'm not going to regulate whether or not you wear a mask in my store. And boy, we did pretty well. There was a lot of people who came in just to feel normal, just to be able to go into a store without a mask. There were a lot of people that felt 
um, uh, that the masks were a terrible thing and, and they wanted to come into the store and support us just because they felt like that. There are other people that wore the mask and they weren't very happy about the fact that I wasn't forcing people to wear one, but they came in anyway because there's not another knife store in town. <laughs> so we actually did pretty well through that time because so many people were passionate about that one issue. And really, I, whether someone wore a mask or didn't wear a mask, we weren't allowing people, we would not allow people to berate people who were wearing a mask or mask people to berate people who weren't wearing a mask. This is a free country. And, and I'm really big on that. And people should be free to take care of whether the mask or not, whether a vaccine or not, people should be free to do on their own what they think they should. It's your body, it's your life. That's what freedom's all about, whether we like it sometimes or not. The COVID um, um, pandemic mm -hmm. um, created a lot of divisiveness in our society. It, it's, it continues it, to. It is, and it's still yeah. here, and, and that's really not what I would want to elaborate on for tonight. Sure. Maybe you and I could have an offline conversation. Oh, yeah, you um, bet. But, but I read where you, you, and I don't know if COVID impacted this or it was already in the works, but you do have an online presence yep. as far as your retail store. Mm -hmm. what, what does that look like? How do you sharpen knives online? You know, that, that's a great question. <laughs> We're in the process of trying to uh, put the fi final touches on having a uh, knife sharpening subscription program, which is something no one's done yet. Uh, and it's a special box, and it's got a special filler in there. You just slip the knives down in it. Uh, we can do 10 knives at a time, and it makes it easy for people to ship knives um, uh, safely, so, so they don't come through the box. Um, so for sharpening, that's the way that's going to work. We don't have that on the website yet, but we're working on that. Uh, we did develop a website, gone through a lot of hard work to get that website up and running. Still needs a lot of work, but it's up, it's running, we're selling through that website. We started that in February. It's something I've been trying to do for the last couple of years. It's been really tough getting it up and running. If anyone tells you getting an e-commerce website with thousands of products up and running is easy, it ain't. <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's one of the hardest things I've done. But yeah, you're right, that and uh, of course, Facebook, we were very present on Facebook, and then YouTube, we have uh, a YouTube channel, one for in the store, and then my YouTube channel, which is Making Knives, where I go out to knife makers, um, which is actually the, the model. I go out to knife makers to see what they do and how they do it, and uh, what it's like where they are. Uh, eventually, we'll go international with that when the world opens up. As it opens up, I'll be traveling around the world showing how knives are made everywhere. Has, has the supply chain problem that we're reading about and hearing about, has that affected your product? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we have a big, big, one of our biggest companies, actually the biggest uh, manufacturer for us is Wusthof Knives out of Germany, Solingen, Germany. And Wusthof is a great knife. The family's been making knives for 200 years, uh, very nice people, all business. They had a huge catalog they've reduced that catalog in half. So fully half of those things we used to get, we can't get anymore. And some of them were really good sellers for us. So they cut that in half. And then out of that half, about half of that, we can't even get. They can't get it out of, of Europe. And when they can get out of Europe, it sits on a ship for far too long. Um, it's gotten very difficult. To, to get any of our imported items in. And we have, we have what, 30 different com countries represented in our store, somewhere around 30 countries. So we import a lot from all over, uh, not just China, though we do bring some of our best knives are actually now from China, uh, of all things. Um, we get virtually nothing from Pakistan. They don't like us. But we get things in from everywhere. And it, it's very difficult getting enough. And it has been for some of the U.S. companies as well. We have one U.S. company, Werther Knives. They're out of Ohio. I went there about a year, year and a half ago now. I went up there to visit with them, sat down with them, family-owned business. They're in the third generation. They make a, a great kitchen knife in a real high-end steel, powdered steel, CPMS 35VN. It's a beautiful knife. 
And it's affordable. It's, it's in that Wusthof price range, but a much better steel, in my opinion. I, I love this steel, a U.S. steel, all U.S. made. And I would love to order $30,000 worth of knives from them tomorrow. Can't do it. They don't have enough people to manufacture enough to even bring us on board as a retailer. Uh, and right now, they're just, they're selling online, they're selling, um, you know, in their own store, which they just expanded a couple of years ago. Beautiful store, they're in Ohio. Uh, they're in a fairly small town. They have no retailers right now. There's not one retailer out there. We could be their first retailer. We can't get them to make enough. And we have other U.S. brands as well, uh, Silver Stag, can no longer supply us through this Christmas. Sorry guys, no silver stag. Um, they're a great knife, handmade, made here in the US, affordable, uh, but they can't physically produce enough because they can't get enough people to scale up to where we need them. And this is a huge problem too going forward as, as we're looking to expand, not only expand the, the effectiveness of our online presence and get that going, but also expand into other stores. You know, down in San Antonio, we're talking to a group down there about opening up several stores there. And Dallas and, and, and Houston, um, uh, there's no, no cutlery stores anymore in, in, in Texas. There's one out in Fort Worth. That's a good store, but, but there's really nothing much else around, N not of our size and our capacity. Um, so we're ready to expand into bigger markets. Uh, and, and supply chain is a huge issue, so much so that we're actually talking at the board level. We're talking about um, uh, exploring the, the possibility of manufacturing, um, not just kitchen knives and hunters, but also folders and other things as well, starting our own manufacturing, just to shore up that supply chain issue. Make your own product. Yeah, yeah, be our own knives. We're already doing some um, cooperative things with some other companies, some other manufacturers. Uh, where we're, we're producing lines, uh, different knife lines, but even those have been interrupted because of the supply chain issue. Uh, we ordered uh, well, some knives back in, uh, I think it was February or so, and it took about three months for us to, we knives, it took about three months to finally get those in. And it's hard too because you're paying, you know, that order was about ten or twelve thousand dollars. So you put ten or twelve thousand dollars out there, then you have to wait for three months until that comes back in. I could have made ten or twelve thousand dollars off of that ten or twelve thousand dollars in three months. So now, how much do you have to make per knife in order to make money? Right off the bat, as soon as you receive those knives, you've already lost money. So it's difficult to get the turns that you need um, and and be able to control cash flows when you know, you're having these supply chain issues. It's so serious. Pricing, does pricing, like we were reading, inflation is occurring in, in a lot of different ways in our, in our country right now, yeah. cause of all these repercussions from supply chain and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So do you pass that along to your customer? Do you raise yeah. the price? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you know, detail, yeah, you know, we have a government that doesn't believe that price increases are gonna be passed to customers and that regular people aren't going to be affected. And it's because they're idiots. They, 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 they don't know business. They know politics, and I appreciate that. They know how to do what they do, but I know how to do what I do. And I'm telling you that there isn't a retailer or a business person out there that doesn't have to pass those costs on to the customers. You know, we, we try and be as competitive as humanly possible while still being profitable enough to sustain our businesses and grow them. We can't shrink down our margins or shrink down our profitability because then we're out of business. So we have to raise those prices. Unfortunately, what happens is in a time of inflationary uh, stress like we're under right now, if those prices continue to go up quickly, um, people's ability to adapt to those higher prices doesn't raise as quickly and you start pricing yourself out of the market until people stop buying things. All right, say for instance, we go into, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of people talking about hyperinflation right now, where loaf of bread in the morning costs $3, and by the afternoon it costs 50. You know, by the next day it's 100 or 200, a uh, Weimar Republic and all of that kind of stuff. I don't think that's going to happen, but inflation is still happening at a very fast pace, right? So, 
say I have a knife, for instance, a Boker Trapper. I used to buy that Boker Trapper for uh, $32 and change. That same Boker Trapper today, and that was four years ago, five years ago, that same Boker Trapper today cost me $65. $65. It's doubled in price. So what do I have to do? I have to tell Mr. Jones that came in through the front door and wants to buy that same Boca Trapper he brought a few years ago that he's not going to be paying $60 for it. Now he's going to be paying $100 for it or $120 for it. And after he's done having a heart attack, he's going to claim that I'm trying to rip him off and he's going to walk out that door because he can't adapt to the price change as quickly as the prices are changing. I've got four companies this week alone that have sent me new uh, price sheets because their prices are going up effective immediately. I've got two people working full time changing prices and just putting in new prices. It's, uh, it's amazing what's going on right now. Now there's a whole school of thought that thinks that we're going to, everything will turn around very quickly and we'll go into a deflationary period. And if that happens, that would be in some ways a nice thing. But it makes it very hard to run a business when you have the supply chain issues, you have the inflationary issues, you have all these other things going on, You're, all you want to do is be a retailer. So. Well, we have time for just a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, but but um, I, I was speaking to one of our uh, uh, Miller College Foundation men today, and we have uh, a financial advisor and company that has worked with the foundation for years and years. And, they were, they were speculating that they see this, um, this inflation that's going on across the board as event driven is the way you talked about it. Hmm. And they're speculating that, that it will be, um, it, will, it will not become systemic, that it will continue to be, just keep going up and up and up, that it will at some point level off. But my experience has been, once things level off, they never go back down. Yeah. Um, so even though it won't keep going up, I don't think the markets anywhere are going to necessarily go back down. And real estate is a great example of that. Yeah. Um, where pricing just um, it gets it gets unaffordable. But so here's here's some quick yeah. questions sure. to start closing this out. So maybe some of these folks in the audience would like mm -hmm. to start some type of business, retail business. You bet. What advice would you give them? Oh, good lord, don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> um, all right, a couple of things. One, you have to write a business plan. And you have to keep it current. Business plan isn't written in stone. A business plan is a working document that you change all the time. And it's something that gives you guidance. It takes everything from up here, puts it onto a piece of paper. Um, people ask me often if I will help them in guiding them in starting up a business. And I really enjoy doing that. But probably eight out of 10 of them can't even get past the point of writing a business plan. Now for somebody like me or for you, it's, it's easy. We do this kind of stuff constantly, right? I don't know how many business plans I've written, but for some people, just the act of writing a business plan is really tough. So you gotta get past that first. You've gotta be able to write your business plan because if you plan to fail, or if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. All right, that's the rule. You've got to write a business plan. It doesn't have to be long. Heck, it could be on a napkin. Well, maybe a little bigger than that. But you need to write a business plan. The second thing is in the beginning, when you're all excited, you want to bring on other people to help you and be your partners. It's fun doing things together. Don't do it. Don't do it. Only bring in a partner if they have something you don't have. Only do it if you have to. Good example of that. If you want to start a business, you've got a great business idea, you've got a great business plan, everything works on paper, your CPA says, man, you've got a great idea, you've got to get this thing up and running. But you have no money. Time to bring on a partner. Bring somebody in who has some money, sell off some equity. You won't own the whole business. It doesn't matter. You've got 100% of nothing. You've got nothing, right? Bring in somebody with some money. Bring in somebody with some money who has some skills as well. Let them help you in starting up the business. So, so that would probably be the other thing. Is, is try, to try and not bring in partners until you absolutely have to. Uh, whether they have a skill you don't have that's critical to the success of the business or whether they have money you need to make that happen. 
What's the other thing? Uh, have a whole bunch of money saved up because you ain't going to make any for a while and be ready to work 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of what's going on or who's doing what or what kind of family is in town or what kind of sacrifices. You're going to make all the sacrifices initially. And be ready to not get paid for a while. Sometimes it takes time to get that cash flow going. So have a way of sustaining life. You know, rice and beans, rice and beans. And, and you'll be okay. And search out people that can help you and, and advise you. Because if you're the only voice you're listening to, that's a good thing. But try and listen to others as well. Don't listen too hard to others. <laughs> but, but listen to some other people that are experienced business people that have gone through all the stuff you have to go through to have a successful business. Oh, one more thing. You're going to fail. Whether it's today or the whole business or one particular part of the business you are trying, you're going to fail. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You'll learn the most from your failures every time. So that leads into my last question. Yes, sir. It was a really nice segue into this question. That yeah. is, if you could go back and do something all over again, mm -hmm. something differently, what would that be? Hmm. Hmm. Something differently. I would have moved to Midland a lot sooner and, uh, and scaled up. Um, I made the big mistake of having so much fun in the business, I wasn't running the business. So uh, I probably would have moved to Midland sooner and scaled up. Um, but that's, that'd be about it. Um, and, and let me just say, I had the best staff of any business person anywhere. They're, they're absolutely amazing. And, and, you know, as much as I like to make people think it's all me, this much. These days, it's this much. It's all about the people that I've been fortunate enough to be able to hire, that work for Bear Claw, that make it all successful. Because uh, I tell you what, I, I'm not nearly as talented as as these folks are. So if you have questions, by all means, these are three of my best right here. Feel free to ask them. Well, we have a few minutes left, so let me give uh, the audience a chance. Anyone has a question? Chris? Uh, the, the whole business model that you have is very interesting. Please, uh, I want to thank you so much, Mr. Tamer, for coming this evening. My pleasure. And please accept this uh, token of our presentation. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very thank you, much. Leticia. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's so nice. Let's get this part now. Let's get to the real. Okay. Idea, okay? <laughs> very good. Oh, that's so nice. And Dr. Thomas, thank you as well. We're not here yet. We're not here. We're doing Q&A right now. Oh, okay. Okay? Give us just about five more minutes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Chris. I teach in English department. I teach technical and business writing. I don't teach business plans, although my, my textbook that I use has a chapter on it. Mm -hmm. But I do teach, uh, I think, uh, reports and have you that are transferable and those sorts of things. I was wondering, you know, like you mentioned the business plans and, you know, people, you know, kind of not doing them or not doing them well. Mm. I'm just curious if someone who teaches you know, that type of writing, uh, you know, what, are you, what do you think are the biggest blocks uh, keeping them from writing them? Or, and if they do write them and you're helping them with them, what are the biggest challenges that you have to kind of push them through and guide them through and mentor them through? Uh, just, you know, just thinking in terms of, you know, is there anything I can sort of keep in mind when I'm teaching my technical to this writing class? Sure. Well, the first and most important thing is you've got to overcome the procrastination with having to actually sit down and do the work. All right, that's a big part of it. People aren't accustomed to actually being self-motivated, and, uh, and that's, that's a hard thing to overcome. Beyond that, it, when actually writing the business plan, it's writing a business plan from the perspective of the person who's going to read it, which is most likely going to be an angel investor, um, possibly a bank, though banks don't really give money to investors or to uh, entrepreneurs, but uh, probably an angel investor. You're going to be looking for some money to open up a legitimate business. 
or you're going to be running the business from your business plan, in which case you're going to be the one reading it, but you really have to look at it from the perspective of an outsider and that you have to answer questions before they're asked. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? If you're going to need $50,000 to start the business, where is that money going to come from? Uh, what are you going to do with it from day one? How are you going to run your business? Who's going to be involved in your business? All these questions that someone has looking at the business from the outside have to be answered through the business plan. The first step to doing that is actually writing a table of contents. That's your guideline. And then you just go down each, each um, uh, item on your table of contents and you start writing out your paragraphs. You just start filling it in. You can use any kind of an outline you want. It, it, there's, there's no hard rules when it comes to writing a business plan. Just make it look professional. But, but the first thing you have to do is look at it from an outsider's perspective looking in. You've got all this stuff up here. You know it all. You know it all. But you've got to put it down on paper. When you do, you'll find out you don't know it all and that there's a lot of things you still have to discover. Well, it's kind of interesting that you know, the way you're talking about it is, in some sense, you know, kind of how I talk about those things you know, with a different angle. And I, I have had some students who work at banks who, and they get mentioned specifically that they review business plans people submit. And sure. They kind of levy the same sort of criticisms uh, about stuff they see on a regular basis, just like you did. You know, sort of not being rhetorical, not focusing on the audience, not being mm. not sort of accounting for. Literally, I think what the audience, uh, you know, them, uh, you know, need to know, you know mm -hmm. all those sorts of details. So I think it's really interesting that you know, you're, you're kind of addressing some of the things I've heard, like you know, banker students. Tell. You know, it's, it's, if, if you meet with an investor, you've all seen Shark Tank, right? Has everyone seen Shark Tank in here? Yeah. Shark Tank, it, that's really how it works. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. In, in, except for when you're meeting with, with investors, as an entrepreneur, you're not usually meeting with four of them that are going to beat you up just for fun. You're usually meeting with one person, maybe two people, uh, occasionally a small group, and, and they're not going to be nice. They're not going to be mean, but they're not going to be nice. They're concerned. They, they love your idea and they want to invest in your idea, but they want to make sure that their money is going to be as safe as it can be while investing it into a highly speculative new business or expanding business, right? This is very risky. They don't want to throw their money away. So you need to write the business plan and then know it inside out so that it answers as many of these questions as you can answer prior to actually them reading it. Now when they pick it up, what do they do? They go right to the financials, they look down a cash flow statement, they might look at the profit and loss, they might look at the um, a balance sheet, and then they're gonna go right to management team. And they're gonna look at that, and that's, those two only happen after they read over the, the first page, the, the one pager that shows you, you know, what the business is all about, and maybe a little paragraph. Uh, and then they're going to look up at you kind of funny and then they're going to ask you a bunch of questions that are already in the business plan. And then later they'll take the business plan home if they're truly interested and they'll read it note for note. And, and it better be good and it better be professional. There better not be any typos. And, uh, and if it's good and you make an impression, you'll get some money to start your business. And then the hard work really just starts. Yes, sir. Did your lady have a question? Certainly. <laughs> Hi, okay. you mentioned um, having ups and downs. Hi, okay, you mentioned having ups and downs mm -hmm. and failures. What's one thing that kept you motivated? Like, that you kept this <laughs> Funny you ask that question. Me and my brother talk about this often. We have the same motivation, and it's living under the overpass. Yeah, yeah. Being homeless. It's a huge motivator for us. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter how big you get or how big you think you are or, or uh, how successful you think your business is. Uh, businesses go out of business for a thousand different reasons. You know, it's, it's the way up is great, but the way down is tough. And it doesn't take much for any one of us to be living under the overpass with that big sign up that says, we'll sharpen for food. <laughs>
I actually have one of those signs, don't I? Yeah, we have one of those. I was going to stand out there on the street and hold it up and try and get some sharpening business in. But that's, that's really the biggest motivator, providing for your family, staying up from the, uh, you know, the soup kitchen line, and, uh, and taking care of your employees. I mean, that's a huge motivator for me, is making sure everyone's taken care of. And this is the last last question, so I'm sure Richard would be glad to oh, yeah. talk for a couple of minutes. I'll, I'll be here. If you have something you want to follow up with. Uh, for a business beginner, what would you ad advise I can learn in the beginning? Right? If you had to just study and study and study before you actually hop into business, what would you advertise to learn? And, um, you know, if I went back to school, I would get a real strong introduction to accounting, uh, area where I'm weak in, and I have to count on other people, depend on other people more so than I sometimes like. Um, a good rounded education in business, just basic business uh, would be very good. Um, writing is important. Uh, writing is critical, critical. Let me tell you, it's, it's critical. Uh, you have to know how to write um, and communicate. You've got to be able to communicate well. Um, but it's important not to spend too long on the education side. Um, depending on what type of business you want to get into, you may want to work in the industry for a while. Sometimes that's not required. Sometimes it's critical that you work in the industry for a while. Make sure it's something you want to get into and learn as much as you can, make as many contacts as you can uh, in the industry. Um, but as far as studying goes, I, I would say probably accounting, uh, writing, communications, and uh, then just get a good rounded education in business. Know the difference between an LLC, C corporation, an S corporation, a sole proprietorship. Uh, know the difference between uh, accrual accounting and just, just know the basics when it comes to running a business and you'll be okay. Uh, but don't be afraid to just get out there and, and start it. You're gonna fail. You're gonna fail in business. Don't be afraid of failure. I mean, I hate it. Don't get me wrong, hate to fail. I hate to fail, but don't be afraid of it. That's where we learn the most, through our failures. So. Well, thank you, Richard, so much. Please help me uh, give a warm thanks to Richard for Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again, Mr. Sanger, for your time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, um, as well, for your time tonight. Um, for your steadfast support to the BBC. And to our local entrepreneurs. Um, I would also like to say to thank our Paul, BBC Paul, Paul McCord, who was uh, in charge and have several meetings with Mr. Stenberg, sorry, and made this possible. Also to Leticia, she is outside, I would like to thank her for her support. And Mr. Dale, also for your support, thank you so much. Before we go, I would like to take a minute from your time to introduce our next event. It's going to be a tax workshop for a small business, independent workers and independent contractors. It's a free event. It's going to be on Thursday, November 11 at 6 p.m. at the Capital Learning Center of Midland College. So we hope to see you there. We're going to talk a little bit about the tax part as well. Speaking of education, that's it right there. That's that's a good one. Go to that. Go go to that. See that. It's important. Thank you. Thank you so much. So well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I hope uh, everyone enjoys the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.